I was speechless when she sent me the message. Even her text messages looked sexy. In the pink, curly writing she used, it was short and sweet and to the point, but even then it filled me with the tightness in my chest that wouldn't go away. At the time, it was a dream come true. Meet me at the Hotel Eras at 11 p.m. And don't be late. I couldn't believe this is happening. Tonight I would meet Lady Dragora. I guess you could say I had a slight problem with weird fetishes. See, I discovered pornography when I was younger. Like most people I knew, I was 12. I was horny. Some I knew said that I could find boobs online if I looked, and I delved headfirst into it. And well, I, I didn't understand the depths of it. I started with generic stuff, naked photos, short clips of porn, and it led into my current level of kink. I started slowly, it was the 90s after all, and internet connections were not what they would become. I waited all day for a single picture to load only to be disappointed when the phone rang and everything was lost. Most of my earlier burgeoning was done in chat rooms, in the steamy squares of private messages, with both my parents awake at work. It was me on the computer every day after school. I didn't discover my predilection of vor until I was in college. Now you've been cruising for somewhat as long as I have, you eventually find yourself in some offbeat things. You can't experience that much depravity and not be changed fundamentally. Eh, well, I was no different. I had recently grown bored with my selection of smut and I went looking for something different. When I found Vor, though, I knew that I had found something... something special. Vor, if you're unfamiliar, is a fetish that centers around eating, or being eaten by something. In a community of niche fetishes, Vor is a very, very niche fetish. I belong to several online communities where we discuss the act and aftermath and trade images online, but I only know of a few people in my area who are actually into it. We meet up once a week to have coffee, gush over our love of Vor, and to gush over our local legend, Lady Dragora. Lady Dragora was a legend in the Vor scene. See, she, she had a subreddit devoted to her videos, a Snapchat full of fans who hungered for her next performance, and a legion of fans willing to pay exorbitant fees for her live shows and recordings. She wouldn't tell people her age, but most of us guessed that she was in her 30s. She had long, dark hair that fell about her in straight waves of ebony silk, and her eyes held a slight hint of some Asian parentage. She was beautiful. She was exotic. And she was an utter sadist. Lady Dragora made the kinds of videos that were illegal everywhere. She made the sort of videos that came with a price tag payable in cryptocurrencies. Now, I'd seen many other so-called Vor videos before hers, but many of them were obviously fake, obviously staged, obviously CGI. People would eat mice only to have a jump cut before they started chewing. They would dangle CGI mice over the gaping maw. They would pretend to eat things, or eat things they were pretending were alive, and after a while, it becomes a little old. Her videos. Her videos were something different. The first video I ever saw involved her eating a rat the size of my hand. The video opened on a terrarium full of squirming rats, not mice, but sewer rats, and as she approached the tank, they all began to run and squeal. She was dressed in would become to be her signature black bodice, garter, black choker, black elbow-length gloves, and long, leather knee-high boots. Some videos seemed to require music laid over the top, but not hers. She reached inside the tank that you could hear the rats screaming and flailing inside as they tried desperately to avoid her hand. She selected one of them and pulled him out with a gloved hand. The rats squirmed and kicked, visibly distressed by her, but she paid him no notice. As she replaced the lid, and walked away from the tank of screaming rodents. Their cries were high-pitched, almost pig-like, and you could hear them off-camera in a low way. The video cut to her holding the rat up to the camera, still squirming and biting as it struggled to free itself. She held it too tight in her clenched fist, and its fur boiled around the fist like water, overflowing in the glass. I expected a jump cut when she opened her mouth and leaned the rat over her head. He screamed pitifully as her teeth encircled his writhing head. He bit at her, lashing out with his sharp teeth, but if she felt him, she seemed not to notice. It writhed anew as her teeth began to close around his head, and as I watched, I thought to myself that here, here would come the jump cut. This will be when the video jags on her teeth, who close her on a plastic rat, and she'll be just another pretender, just another charlatan, just another... The blood flowed out as the rat made its final scream. Her teeth sank into him and tore at his skin. 
And when she came away, she was chewing, chewing, chewing. And the rat's body twitched in her hand as she ate him. The twitching stopped before she went in for another bite, but the blood made a macabre sort of fountain as it ran down her gloved fingers and pattered to the floor. She ate the whole rat, one bite at a time, as the tail disappeared down her throat. I was hooked. I probably watched about a dozen of her videos before I dared to show anyone else. Sometimes she bit, which was hot, but sometimes it seemed that she would just swallow whatever she was eating whole, and she worried it down with little difficulty. Eels, white mice, rats, chicks, they all went down her throat, and my friends and I paid $79.99 a video and got our rocks off behind closed doors. Two months ago, she put a small camera on a mouse and swallowed it whole, all the while videoing its descent into her stomach. The camera must have cost her quite a bit. Between the size of the camera, the night vision interface, and the price of the video, I knew it wouldn't be something we could expect often. The footage changed the way that I viewed my fetish. Watching something struggle in her stomach, watching its final moments, was far more intimate than watching her swallow it whole. I told her as much in the comment section of her website. I spilled my guts to her, hoping to impress her. Somehow. Somehow. It worked. I wish now that I never made that stupid comment. So I was shocked when she'd responded. I'd been sitting at the office with the other members of our group, Doug and Matt and David, and we were all discussing the latest video of Lady D, and my phone chirped loudly. I looked down to check it, and saw a banner informing me that Lady Dragora had responded to your comment. I almost spewed coffee on Doug before opening the message and reading what she'd written. The guys leaned in close, wondering what I had said to garner such attention, and when I opened her message, it was eight short words. How profound. I would love to chat sometime. David whistled through his teeth. Wow, she almost never talks to fans. You're in, man. And so I was. As they sat crowded around me, I answered her, and she immediately began our strange correspondence. I didn't question at the time, but the speed with which she picked our conversation had triggered a red flag. It was as though she was just waiting for me to respond, waiting for her prey to wander into her field of influence so she could snap the trap shut and watch him squirm. For three months, we chatted almost every day. We talked about normal things, music, food, the usual getting to know you bullshit, and then eventually, we made it to topics that were a little more personal. It turned out that she held some strange beliefs about life force believed that consuming the flesh of still-living creatures would give her their life force and extend her own life in some way, and I asked her if she'd ever eaten human flesh. But she just joked that maybe I'd find out someday, and danced around the subject. The more I talked to her, the more I became certain that she had traveled much and knew things that I could only guess at. She spoke about distant places and strange customs, and if I hadn't been so enchanted by the attention of a celebrity... I might have seen some of the numerous red flags. She talked a lot about places you didn't see on the travel channel. Places that didn't have names scrawl across the map. And locations both ancient and remote. A month ago, she asked me if I would roleplay with her. I agreed. Of course I did. Because by this point, I was hooked on her attention. But even in my haze of glamour, I knew there was something a little off. Her persona was that of some large reptile, and mine was always that of some prey animal fit only for ingestion. She would describe my ingestion, my passing between large and ancient lips, and my slow descent towards transitioning into nutrition. I would describe my struggles, my vain attempts at escape, but she would always catch me and describe, in loving detail, my demise at her jaws. I loved it. This was my fetish, after all, and I often walked away from our sessions with a bounce in my step and a ball of used tissues in the garbage can. People probably have a hard time understanding how someone achieves satisfaction at the idea of being devoured, but to me, it was no different than any other obsession. We would roleplay twice a week. Her scenarios and story threads became darker as we went, and before long, she wasn't just swallowing me whole, but biting me and ripping off parts of me as she went. I was less on board with these instances. Imagining myself going through these pains were never my thing, but she always smoothed it over with personalized videos or custom works just for me. She made me feel special. 
made me feel accepted. And that's what made me so easy to draw in. This was also when I was approached by Justin. His screen name was Furry Locks on the board in question, and until he messaged me, I'd never heard of him. My only correspondence with him was a message left in my inbox one morning before school. It was hastily written, full of spelling errors, and intrigued me to no end. I read it twice before school, and when I showed it to my friends in the Vor group, they brushed it off as a jealous fan. His message was not long, but it did make me question some rumors that I had read on the board. It read, You don't know me, but my name is Justin. I understand that you've been close to the internet persona Lady Dragora. I don't know how much you know about her, but whatever she's told you, she may not be 100% in what she seems to be. I had a friend whom I'd known since grade school who caught the attention of the lady. Their relationship was brief, a month or two maybe, and then one night, he told me that she'd invited him to her hotel room. I didn't think anything of it until he didn't respond to my calls or texts for two days. He's been missing now for three months, and your new lady friend has either blocked me or refused to respond to any of my messages. I'm not trying to turn you away from your current relationship, whatever that might entail. I'm simply trying to warn you. Be on your guard. I was hesitant to respond. It seemed better to just ignore him, but after a particularly grisly RP session a week later, I decided to message him and get some information. I was still very much under her spell, but some of our conversations made me weary. I mean, she was, after all, still a stranger on the internet, and having grown up in the age of stranger danger, I was very wary of people online pretending to be someone they aren't, a collection of online videos or not. My message, however, was never opened. It was never read. And when the invitation to her hotel room came across my box, I decided to put my fears aside and go for it. That's how I came to be in the hotel room two hours ago. She sent me the text around six in the afternoon. Meet me at the Hotel Heiress at 11 p.m. Don't be late, was all it said. But it was enough to get my blood running hot. The Hotel Heiress was not a huge hotel, but it was one of the largest in this part of Chicago. The borough of Chicago was an hour from campus, but I'd driven the distance gladly. If she'd told me to drive to New York that night, I'd have done it. And with the invitation being so close to home, I decided I would be a fool not to accept. I told my friends from the coffee shop where I was going. They told me to take some video and tell them when I got home. And I set out for the hotel. I had arrived early, two hours early, hoping that maybe we could have a meal before, well, before whatever was going to happen tonight. I inquired at the front desk, and the man behind the counter gave me a knowing little smile as he slid the keycard across to me. She's gone out for a little while, but she mentioned that she would likely have a guest tonight. Have fun, he said. As I turned to go to the elevator, I wondered how often he'd had to do this for her. How often did she have guests? I took the elevator up to the penthouse and found a lavish one-bedroom suite, decked out in rich fabrics and expensive furniture. I recognized it as the backdrop of many of her videos, found a camera already set up in the corner. She had left me a note, too, telling me to make myself at home, and that she would be back around 11. The wait was nerve-wracking, and when the elevator finally came up to the penthouse, I felt a surge of excitement. She was framed in the elevator doors as they opened. It was the first time I'd ever met her in person. She wore a long tan coat, the same black boots that she had in her videos, and her shiny black hair was pulled back in its accustomed tail. As she stepped off the elevator, she let the coat puddle to the floor and I could see her familiar black corset. She smiled when she saw me, and as I rose to greet her, she held out a finger, indicating me to stand and be quiet. She circled me, drinking me in with her eyes, and the hungry way she looked at me made me both incredibly aroused and extremely uncomfortable. She was looking at me the way I look at particularly tasty meals, and though this is my fetish, I had never seen someone look at another person in this way. She didn't say a word, just walked over to the camera and pointed it towards me. As she swayed back to me, I saw the red light was on. Don't worry, she said and her voice hinted of foreign places and exotic locales. This is just for me. I never post anything online without your consent. I smiled at her and started to disrobe, but she stopped me 
with a delicate hand. Leave them on. I like to handle the clothes myself. She purred. She stepped away from me then, eyes smoldering as she held me in her gaze. And then... Something happened. If you've ever seen one of those old werewolf movies where the whole body shifts, then you may have some idea, but then... If not, I'll try to explain it as best I can. Her body seemed to ripple. Her whole form shuddered like, it, like an image in a pond, and suddenly there was something else in front of me. Her body was a long mass of jade scales, towering 12 feet high. As it reached its full height, it had to crouch to avoid hitting the ceiling, but this seemed to suit its needs just fine. It crouched to eye level, and its spade-shaped head hovered inches from my body, and I realized that its eyes, those huge and hovering pools of death, they were the same as hers. I was trapped by those eyes, like a bird before the snake, and when she struck... I never even had a chance to run. So if you're reading this, then your next question must be how am I writing it? Being eaten is normally where a story like this would end, but unfortunately, for me, it's not. Lady Dragora, that queen serpent of myth, has been dining on humans for a very, very long time, it seems. She neither bit nor tore me, and instead struck with precision born of years of practice and swallowed me whole with little effort. And as I slid down her slimy throat, I felt the walls caress me and the suffocating darkness inviting me towards the terror. She had let me keep my phone, however, and as I wriggled to get it, I could feel a new sensation coursing through the giant muscle that was her body, the squirming desire for more. And that's when I realized what she wants. She doesn't want a quick meal. She doesn't want a satisfying feed. She wanted a terrified body to thrash and scream as her body does what it does best. She wants my last few hours to be her pleasure. So I've been sitting as still as I can for the last hour of my life, writing this message to the outside world. I've sent a copy to my friends at the coffee shop, a copy to the Chicago police, and I posted a copy here. I mean, in hopes that someone would read this and take it seriously. I now know what happened to Justin's missing friend. What likely happened to Justin himself. The fate awaits me at the end of my life, but, but I want my death to be the last. So if you read this, and you see her, don't fall for her game. Don't let yourself be another meal for Lady Dragora. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are back after Halloween. So, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreons. Those uh, specifically are the ones that are in the description, and Joey Gilbert, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Chumpinski, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van House, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Asia, the Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kao, Caleb Dougal, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Alex, Steampunk Sinner, The Rafael Rodriguez, Optimistic Avocado, and Dr. Strawberry. If you guys would like to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Even helping with $1 actually helps keep me alive. So a big thank you to all of you who are there from $1 all the way up to however much that you guys give. Thank you. I appreciate you guys subscribing and checking back with the channel every single day because, dear lord help me, we are on daily uploads, meaning new horror stories from me here at Mr. Creepypasta on YouTube or Mr. Creepypasta on Spotify. Sweet dreams, kids.